Well, I hope you had a great Christmas. <clears throat> Lots of things go on around here at Christmas time. If we kind of reflect on the Christmas that we had, um, if you were here on Christmas Eve, it was really, really neat thing. We had somewhere between, we can't get an exact count, apparently we can't count that high, somewhere between 209 and 250 people in the church. All I know is that every chair was full and there was folding chairs in the cryer room and behind the pews as well, so that was a really neat thing. Um, I want to thank Blessed for that. Blessed worked so incredibly hard on that for so long. Um, under Sue's leadership, they did an amazing thing, so that was very, very cool. It was very exciting in the church, but then we, we kind of look into our, our personal lives and lots of things happen around Christmas, and that is that family and friends come to visit us, some thankfully, some maybe not so thankfully. But family comes to visit, and, and so we've had lots of family, and, and, and maybe if you're a traditionalist that you open presents on Christmas Eve, you might have got to open some presents on, on Christmas Eve and get some things you wanted and give other people things they needed, so that was cool. You got up Christmas morning, and if you didn't open them the night before, you open them Christmas morning. Then maybe you ate too much, which is something I did. You eat too much, and maybe some, I know not us, because we're not that group, but some of us drink too much. Lots of no, that's not us. We didn't do any of that. You drink too much, and, and then you have to drive back home, and if you were out of town, you had to fight the weather because it seemed like the snow dumped just on Wiggins on Christmas Day, and everybody else was kind of clear. So we, we made it through Christmas, and then you just, you just crash out Christmas night, and you're done, and, and then it's gone. And so now we, we stand in the aftermath of Christmas. Family has gone home, again, some thankfully, some not so thankfully. We're on our diets already for the new year, right? We were already starting to think about those diets, that weight we're going to lose. For, yeah, I see head shaking. We're going to you know, get off all that stuff. We, we're on our diets. Um, kids have broken their toys already. Um, we have already planned strategically after church today how we're going to hit those stores to take back those gifts that we really don't want. Christmas is gone, right? Well, according to the calendar, it is. What I want to talk to you today is about what happens in the aftermath of Christmas. As you, you might notice that I didn't take down the old Holy Night banner and or the Advent banner because we've been talking for about four weeks. There was one week in there I didn't because we were treated um, to the choir who gave us that cantata. But for, for four weeks now, we've been talking through Advent and talking about going beyond the obvious of Christmas. And today I really wanted to finish it up and tell you that the, really the most important part of Christmas comes after December 25th. And if you think about any historical event that is really, really important, the event itself is of less importance than the aftermath. I mean, think about that for just a second. That's kind of deep. The event itself can be made or broke, if you will, not by it, but by what happens afterwards. Now, if we look historically, um, some things that maybe we should have taken note of that we maybe don't even know anything about because there wasn't an aftermath. For example, who invented the telephone? Can anybody, anybody out there, a scholar? Alexander Graham Bell. That is absolutely wrong. That is absolutely wrong. You see an Italian man named Antonio Musi invented the telephone, but in Italy at the time, nobody cared about it. They said, that's a ridiculous idea. So historically, Antonio Musi gets nothing. Of interest to maybe some, if you're an astronomer, there's been 280 new craters discovered on the moon in recent months. Anybody hear about that? We just don't care about craters on the moon, do we? A new species of dolphin was just discovered not too long ago either. Anybody hear about that? Can't eat dolphin, can't have them as pets, we don't care. We just don't care. There's an unknown disease in Africa, an unknown disease in Africa that, that's just in the last few months has killed 15 people and the, from the onset of the disease to death is exactly right around 24 hours. Anybody hear about that? That's in Africa, we don't, we don't care. Those are events that maybe we should know something about. But because in their aftermath, nothing was done, nothing was said, there was no publicity, there was no media blitz, nothing happened. And so we forget about them. 
Now, on the other hand, there's events that do occur that maybe we should forget about. Anybody know who Ray Rice is? Ray Rice, the NFL running back who was caught on film uh, abusing his wife in the hotel elevator? Okay. With no disrespect, there are women that deal with that every day, and that's a sad, sad state of affairs. But for some reason, Ray Rice made the news. He got kicked out of the NFL. He can't play. And, and what about all those other women? But the media is snagged on to Ray Rice, and that's something that's much bigger than maybe it should have been. Donald Trump, anybody heard of Donald Trump? <laughs> I don't want to get too deep into politics, so I'm going to try real hard here. But is Donald Trump as great a presidential hopeful as he makes himself out to be? Or does he just have the media and their attention? Yeah, you see, he is a master of media. That's how Donald Trump has made his billions, I suppose, by being able to manipulate people and manipulate the media. And so, while he may not be the best choice, we remember Donald Trump. We don't know Antonio Musi. Who's got a cell phone out here? Okay, we don't know him, but we know Donald Trump. And then if you think about any other fad that comes along over the course of history, whether you're 8 or 80, we've all had fads from bell bottoms to pet rocks to now hoverboards. What is determined after the fact is what makes or breaks something historically. And so as we stand in the aftermath of Christmas, Christmas has come and has gone according to the calendar. And the importance of Christmas is determined not by what we celebrated two days ago, because it didn't happen two days ago, but by how we move forward with that celebration. Because Christmas happened 2,000 and some odd years ago. Its importance lies in what we do. And so as we stand in the aftermath of Christmas, that's exactly what I want to do, is I want to talk to you about where do we go from now? What now? Are you ready for what comes now that Christmas is gone? Sure you are, because there's 363 calendar years until next Christmas, right? Just checking to see if you're paying attention. Some of us, that's how long it's going to take us to pay off those credit card bills. <laughs> Minimum payment at 22% interest, you're good to go. 363 calendar days until next Christmas. So let's talk about it. And the way I want to t talk to you and bring this to your attention today is through our scripture, of course, which um, Melissa read from, from the Gospel according to Matthew. And what we're going to see is that there are three distinctive groups of people in this text. And we can learn something from each of these three groups. And what these three groups teach us is what we are going to be faced with as we move forward after Christmas. So we're going to look at these three groups, and then we're going to kind of put it all together and see why that's so important to us as Christians in the church. So the first group of people we are going to call the worshipers. They are the worshipers, and they are represented in our text by the magi. And in order to understand the worshipers, we have to kind of look at these magi a little bit. Magi is not short for magician. They were not sorcerers, um, black magic, voodoo. Um, they were not Wiccan. They were, they were nothing like that. Magi, actually, if you take that entomology of that word way, way, way back when, meant an astronomer. The Magi were scientists. They were astronomers, men, and I suppose perhaps women, who looked at the sun and the moon and the stars and how they moved in a celestial way. So these Magi, as our text tells us, who are scientists, they hear these prophecies about this star. They, they, they read these prophecies about this star, and they go in search of this baby Jesus who is to be born king of the Jews. And they come from the east. Where east? No one really knows. I, I tried to figure that out. You know, Persia, Mesopotamia. All we know is east. That's all that really matters is they came from the east, far off, and they traveled looking for this baby Jesus. Now, here's kind of a side note. There were absolutely more than three magi. Absolutely more than three magi. It's kind of cute because we've actually named the magi, and I didn't write their names down, you know. 
But we've named the Magi, and we say there's three of them, but that is not the way they would have traveled back then. There would have been a large group. They would have traveled in a caravan. They were going across hostile and desolate territory, and they would have had to carry supplies, and they would have had servants, and they would have had many camels with them. So a large caravan, we'll just say three Magi, travel from the east. These are foreigners, understand. And they get, here, they get and they find Herod. And they, Herod, they're so like, we're, we heard about this Jesus. We know about the prophecies. We see this star. Where is this baby Jesus? And Herod turns to those scribes and teachers of the law, and they give him some information. Oh, yeah, he's over in Bethlehem. So the Magi travel to Bethlehem. This is where it starts to get important. All that was just rambling. So if you weren't paying attention, now you've got to pay attention. They get to Bethlehem, and they find the manger, right? Wrong. No, thank you, Emily. They didn't find the manger. If you listen to what Melissa said, they entered the house. So the Magi were not at the manger. Sorry to, to break that to you. They were not at the manger. How long after the birth of Jesus did they arrive? Again, not something we know a whole lot about. Probably within two weeks to two years. Remember when Herod finds out about this baby Jesus and can't find him, he orders all the boys in Bethlehem, two years and under, to be killed. We'll talk about dear old King Herod in a moment. But somewhere between two weeks and two years afterwards, these magi come to the side of the baby Jesus in the house, and they drop to their knees and worship. Now that's important. That's important. These are men that are not Jewish, from a land far, far away, who have all they've done is heard about this baby Jesus, who they travel hundreds, maybe thousands of miles. They enter foreign territory. They go between, for this foreign king. They follow this star for maybe up to two years. We don't know how long they traveled. And they drop to their knees and they worship Jesus. Where that becomes important to us in the aftermath of Christmas is, I mentioned earlier, that we had 200 and some people in this church, God's church, on Christmas Eve. Not all those people are here today. Some of those people will never, never walk through these doors again. We can hope that they do, but the truth is that they might not. Those people came to worship Jesus. And what matters most of all is that, not that they were where they were from, not what they brought as gifts, but that they did come to worship Christ. And so in the aftermath of Christmas, as we think about those 200 and let's just say 230, so I have to quit saying some, 230 people that came into this church, are we ready to accept 230 people in this church every Sunday? Joan raised her hand. <laughs> well, and that's, that's part of the question. That's very good. But in the aftermath of Christmas, isn't our hope, and I've heard many people say it already today, isn't our hope in the aftermath of Christmas that we do fill 230 in the pews every Sunday from this point forward? I've heard people say it. I hope they all come back. New faces, that's great. But are we ready for that? Are we ready for the complications that are created because of that? If you were here on Christmas Eve, people were shoved into pews. People were sitting in folding chairs. If they, 230 people were here this morning, now think about this for a second before you respond, you might not get to sit in that very special place that you sit in every Sunday. <laughs> are we ready for that? Not only that, but if you were here on Christmas Eve, you saw that there was a great diversity of people that filled this church. I had somebody call me, don't know who, they just called me, Pastor, what should I wear to church for Christmas Eve? Isn't the unsaid message that there's an expectation? You see, try as we might, as a church, we create generalities whether we do it consciously or subconsciously, we create what a person who comes to Wiggins Community Church looks like. Are we ready to completely push that out the door? Are we ready to welcome men who wear dresses or, or, or women who don't? 
Now, this has nothing at all to do with throwing our theology out the door. That's not what I'm talking about. My point is, these magi come from a place far off from Bethlehem. And if you think a little bit about the Jewish culture, they disliked pretty much everybody that wasn't them. Right? They couldn't intermarry. They couldn't talk to Gentiles. They, they couldn't drink from them. They couldn't eat from the same. They, they, you know, they couldn't come to the temple. They did not like anybody that was an outsider. But I read through this text a number of times, and I see nowhere in there that, that the people in Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph said, Hey, whoa, whoa. You ain't like us. Are we ready to embrace 230 people that are not like us in the aftermath of Christmas? Because the worshipers will come. We are a growing church, and that's a super positive thing. I sit here now, and even today, I see faces that I didn't see last week or the week before. When I got here to the church, we were averaging somewhere around 45 to 50 people. Now we're adver averaging around 100. Are we ready to keep growing, and are we ready for the issues that will come because of that? The second group of people. The second group of people that we have to consider in the aftermath of Christmas is the opposition. The opposition. Now, the opposition is demonstrated in our text through King Herod, our lovely King Herod. King Herod, if you don't know about King Herod, was... Not a very nice man. King Herod, as the story goes, actually had his wife and two of his sons killed. He had them killed because he was afraid of losing the power that he so wanted. He was a man that was worried about power and fame for himself. Now, here's an interesting fact about King Herod, too. He was also half Jewish. So here's a man who's half Jewish who knows the prophecies about Jesus and who he will be, this king of the Jews. And instead of embracing it, he becomes the opposition to Jesus. Now, we would like to believe that we live in a cheery little world where everything is all butterflies and cotton balls and everybody gets along. But are we ready for the opposition that will come? Because anytime there's change... Anytime there's growth, anytime people come closer to Christ, it creates opposition. And so as we think about Christmas and 230 people in the pews and what comes over the coming year, are we ready for the opposition? King Herod tells the Magi, hey, you guys go over there and find them and you talk with them and when you're done visiting the baby Jesus, come back so that I may worship him. Right. See, there's something important to know about the opposition. We, we like to think that the opposition is out there. And there is opposition out there, and we all know about the opposition out there. Those are the people that won't come in here. Those are the people that argue with you about Jesus and all things Christianity. They don't want nothing to do with it. They'll tell you it's foolish. They'll tell you it's silly. And Isn't it strange how these people that argue so vehemently against Christianity know so much about it? Isn't that kind of strange? Just like King Herod. That's not the opposition we got to worry so much about, though. It's the opposition from within that we have to worry about. See, King Herod was trying to pretend that he was the in crowd. I'm half Jewish, and I want to worship this Jesus, too. Come back and tell me where he's at so I can worship him. Are we ready from the, for the opposition that comes from within the church in the wake of Christmas? The, this is my assigned pew seat. I've been sitting here since, and you fill in the blank. I like this color carpet. I don't want to change. You did what to the service? Are you, no way. They cannot serve communion and or pick up the tithe. What's that pastor wearing up there? What kind of music is that? Why do we have to cater to their needs? Why do we have to build a new building? If you think it's just starting because I just mentioned it, then you should walk around with me for about a week. The worst opposition that any church faces is from within. 
We can see all that coming from out there. It's the opposition from within we have to worry about. Are we ready to face that opposition now that Christmas has come and gone? Now the third group, the third group of people is, is representative of the chief priests and teachers of the law. And I have to tell you that I started off calling this third group the ignorant. And I thought that was kind of callous. So I changed this third group to the indifferent. The indifferent. Just so you know, what I meant about ignorant is ignorant in that they know, but they refuse to believe. That's what I meant. Not stupid, dumb ignorant, but they know, but they refuse to believe. And, and so I, I, I changed this to the indifferent. We talk about the chief priests and teachers of the law. The Magi come to Herod, ask him, where's this baby Jesus? Herod says, you know, I don't know. Let's turn to these, these Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious Jewish leaders. They'll surely know. They quote a little scripture. And then strangely enough, in this particular text, they just stop. It, it, that's kind of the last we hear of them. Now, if you think about Jesus' ministry, it's kind of strange because when he's 30 and begins his, his full-fledged itinerant rabbi ministry, they are all over him in opposition. But at this point in the story, they're just indifferent. They just don't seem to care one way or they're, oh, yeah, we read those prophecies, you know, Bethlehem, Judah, yeah, stars, yeah, great, king of the Jews, whatever. He's over there. But they're absolutely indifferent. This group is the most important group to us as we consider what happens after Christmas. Because in that C&E group that was here Christmas Eve, the Christmas and Easter group, are a lot of people really that are indifferent. They haven't made a choice for Jesus Christ. They come to church because that's what we've done. And they'll be back on Easter because that's what we've done. But not only are the C&E people the indifferent, but there's people out there in the world that are just indifferent. They really don't care one way or the other. The trouble with the indifferent is that they haven't been educated. And once the indifferent are educated, whether it be by us or someone else, they become one of the two groups that we already talked about. They become either a worshiper or they become someone in opposition. And that's why they are so important to us as we consider moving on past Christmas. Because they can be positive or they can be negative to the church. Do we know the danger that they possess or the possibilities that they possess? And are we allowing them to just continue to be indifferent? I have a story about not knowing how dangerous something can be, and it, it involves a, a youth pastor from Jacksonville, um, Florida. This youth pastor was giving a sermon one Sunday, and he was giving a sermon on sin, and how sin is like Russian roulette. You know, you can sin over and over again, and get away with it, but eventually it catches up with you, kind of like the Russian roulette thing. So to, to add emphasis to his sermon, he brought a gun to the pulpit. Now, he thought the gun was empty, thought. You can already see where this is going, someplace bad. He thought the gun was empty. Throughout his sermon in various places, he puts the gun to his head and pulls the trigger. He gets away with that two or three times. People are like, oh, oh he's got a gun, and, and yeah. Well, about the fourth time, the gun goes off. Now, it was just loaded with a blank, but if you know about blanks, blanks at very close range can be just as dangerous. They have uh, wax at the end to keep the um, gunpowder in the cartridge, and so it, it shot himself in the head. He didn't die, but he, he definitely made his point, I guess. I mean, that's a, that's a sermon you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life, right? I mean, right? Okay. But the point was he held something in his hand. He had something right before him that could make or break, and he didn't realize how dangerous, how important it was. Did he handle it with kids' gloves? Did, did, did he give it the attention that is due? And when we talk about this third group, the indifferent, we have to handle them with kids' gloves. We have to make sure that we address them and that before they become the opposition, that we can help them to become the worshipers. That means we have to step outside of the church because we know that most of those people aren't going to come back. Well, maybe Easter time. Maybe we should get together a task force to identify them. Hey, are you, were you here at Christmas? Okay, you step over here. You but it doesn't work that way. The indifferent is really our job moving forward. And so in the wake of Christmas, as Christmas has come and gone, 
calendar-wise, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready? Are we ready to embrace the worshipers, those people that will come back, hopefully week after week, that, that don't know what mold they're supposed to fit? And, and geez, God forbid we get away with that mold and just welcome people because they're worshiping Jesus. Have you ever thought about what God sees, what, what God saw when those three magi dropped to the ground in front of Jesus in that house? Did, do you think he saw three guys from Persia or three guys from Mesopotamia? Did he see three guys with turbans on their heads? Or did he just see three children of God who came to worship? Are we ready to embrace the worshipers? Are we, are we ready to fend off the opposition? Are we ready? I mean, I know a lot of you, I've spoken to you, and, 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 and thanks be to God. We did something right here at Wiggins Community Church, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, we really did something right this year because I've had a number of people tell me that, that they've really been able to focus as to what Christmas really, really means. Can we continue to do that? Can we put our hand up and say, I don't want to hear your opposition? We're doing what God wants us to do, and you can join us or not. And we want you to join us, but you're not going to stop what we're doing. We're going to keep moving forward. Are we ready to fend off the opposition? And are we re willing to seek, seek, everybody say that word, seek, the indifferent? They're probably not going to come storming through that door next Sunday because I call right now for them to do so. I wish I had that kind of power. It's often been said that my job is easy. I give you the message. Your job is hard. You have to go live the message. The message is that we have to seek the indifferent in our lives. And so in the, in the wake of Christmas, what happens now is up to you. God has done his part. God did his part 2,000 and, well, technically something else you might not know. Jesus was probably born around 4 B.C., so 2,019 years ago, God did his part. And for 2,019 years, he's been waiting for mankind, you, to do your part. And until your part is done, Jesus won't come again. Are you ready for all of that in the aftermath of Christmas? Because either it's just a day on the calendar with 363 more days to go, or it's the greatest single event in the history of mankind which calls us to do something about it every day of our lives. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, <clears throat> December 25th, the day that the Christian church has chosen to celebrate the birth of your son, you, into human form has come and gone. We know now that the job is up to us. We need to welcome the worshipers. We need to fend off the opposition and we need to seek out the indifferent. I ask for strength for every person here today that in the coming days, weeks, months, and years of their lives, that they never forget the truly important part of Christmas. And that is what we do after it has come and gone. It is through Jesus Christ that all the Lord's people say, Amen. I invite the musicians to come forward. We have one song left to sing. Um, it features Valerie Sandoval on a solo. It is called Overcome, so I invite you to stand as you are able and please join us in singing. <laughs> 